Andrew McColl here from Family Voice Australia, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Family Voice webinar today. I have as my guest, Professor Jim Allen. Jim has a chair at the University of Queensland uh, in law. He, he's published widely in areas of legal philosophy and constitutional law in the US, in the UK, in Canada and Australia. He also has a sideline interest in bills of rights. He's opposed to them. And he's glad to have moved to a country which happens to be Australia without a national bill of rights. His latest book is Democracy in Decline that he published in 2014. He writes widely for newspapers and weeklies, including The Australian, The Spectator, Australia and Quadrant. And he'll be speaking with Professor Augusta Zimmerman at a Voting Matters Forum at the Tingalpa Hotel next Wednesday, the 1st of March. Jim Allen, it's a welcome to you for our Family Voice webinar. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Uh, if I'm in the business of uh, plugging myself, I actually have a new book out last year called The Age of Foolishness. It's a book about comparative constitutional law and the sort of modern trends towards ever greater judicial activism, references to international law, all sorts of terrible things. But uh, that's uh, Age of Foolishness. But I, I, I uh, that came out about a year ago. But thanks for having me, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, look, we're looking forward to our, our time today, and we're talking about some questions on the voice. And my first question is, what is lacking in the Constitution 120 years after Federation that, that requires that we have constitutional change? Well, I mean, people's opinions are always going to differ. I think we have a, a, a good Constitution here in Australia. Uh, Hard to believe, but we're actually the fourth or fifth oldest written constitution that's continuously been operating. Basically, with two world wars, there are no old constitutions in Europe, except for Switzerland, maybe. Um, uh, so the old constitutions are Britain, but doesn't have a written constitution. New Zealand doesn't have a written constitution. Uh, the Americans do, older than ours. Uh, Canada does, 1867, updated in 1982, older than ours. Uh, but we, uh, in uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, effectively opted to copy the American Constitution. This accent of mine is Canadian, uh, just so your listeners know. But uh, we have the most American Constitution, other than maybe we could argue about the Philippines. But uh, so effectively, what we did is we copied the uh, Madisonian. James Madison basically drafted most of the American Constitution. He was one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, and we copied the American Constitution in, in the sense that we we went for the American version of federalism. We we decided not to copy the Canadian version. Canada has two lists of powers, one for the center, one for the provinces, states. And we copied the Americans, one list of powers for the center. Everything else goes to the states, and the idea was that we'd have strong states, and our, our judges have made a strong center. We have American bicameralism. I don't know how many people know. And this is one of the problems we're going to talk about the voice. Almost no democracies have a strong upper house. You know, Australians think, oh, it's normal to have a bunch of uh, independent senators from Tasmania block a government. This never happens. The only countries with a strong upper house in the democratic world are the U.S. We copied them and Italy. And Italy has been trying to, you know, change theirs. They haven't been successful yet. So in Canada, the, there is no elected upper house. There's an appointed one that does nothing. In Britain, there's an appointed upper house, the House of Lords. It has a bit of delaying power. So if you win an election in Britain or Canada, you want to cut the budget deficit, you just do it. In Australia, you have to bargain with some, somebody from Tasmania who has an extended family and lots of friends. You know, it's, it's, a, it's very hard to get things done. And there's a sort of built-in bias against the right of center parties, because if you're big spenders, the, the independents who make it into the Senate, they never block big spending, but they block, you know, careful husbandry. So we have a really strong upper house, very unusual, copied that from the Americans. And of course, if you put in a voice body, you're going to put in another layer. Uh, effectively, uh, it's going to be hard to get anything done. That's not my main reason for opposing it, but it's a problem. Okay. So with the amount of taxpayers' money being provided for the Aborigines today, what is it that they seem to be really lacking? Well, again, it's not easy to solve uh, 
solve these problems. So my view is that uh, a sort of symbolic voice type body will do nothing to solve the practical problems. And I don't really think too many people actually think it will. Uh, I mean, this is a government, after all, that got rid of uh, the ban on alcohol in Northern Territories, despite quite a few uh, leaders in the Aboriginal community, especially women, saying, don't do this, don't do this. They've sort of partially put it back on. Uh, so I don't think it's really being sold the voice, not with a straight face, as actually going to solve very much on the ground. I guess the general argument you're hearing is by giving some Aboriginal people more of a say, but they have quite a bit of say. We have more uh, Aboriginal people in the uh, parliament today than uh, a higher percentage than the percentage of Aboriginals in the wider population. I think what there's 11 in parliament. Uh, that's as a percentage of the 150 plus 76, 150 MPs in the lower house, 76. Nine. That that beats their percentage of the population. You know, I'm not into the the identity politics game where you measure everything in the wider population and then you insist that you know there's x percent so we need x percent on boards x percent and you know getting prof professorial position that sort of thing that's really not a good way there's no countries that have gone down that road where it works very well that's what identity politics is uh you see that in the diversity bureaucracy uh, our universities are infected with it not just with aboriginals but women but everything and it's really destructive in the long term of initi uh, individual initiative and the sort of Martin Luther King idea where you judge people by the quality of their character and how hard they work. And now it's sort of, you know, how many people with this skin pigmentation do we have? How many people with this sort of reproductive organs? Really bad. Uh, but if you're asking what what would the voice actually do on the ground? Well, my answer is, you know, pr probably rhymes with the fifth Roman emperor, the guy who was a pyromaniac. <laughs> okay. So having said that, are there issues with, with the Aborigines that probably require cultural, ideological and moral changes as opposed to constitutional ones? Now, I'm thinking particularly about educational shortcomings, poverty, alcohol abuse and domestic violence. Well, again, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a constitutional lawyer, legal philosopher. It's obvious that on terms of social statistics, Aboriginals don't do very well. Teenage pregnancy, alcoholism, uh, you know, kids growing up without a dad. Uh, you can go through the social statistics and they're all bad. And I think when you disambiguate it and you look at Aboriginals who live in cities versus ones who live out uh, in, you know, very isolated places in the country, well, the, the Aboriginals who've moved to the cities do much better and their, their uh, social statistics are much closer to the median, the average. It's very hard to have high outcomes in isolated places with almost no opportunities for employment. Um, you know, that's that's just hard for anybody, but it's particularly hard. And I think anybody with a heart wants to try to fix these things. They're very hard to fix. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone's against doing what we can to fix. There's some there's thousands of bodies right now aiming to try to improve outcomes for Aboriginals. What I don't like is trying to change a written constitution and entrench into it this body, which will be near impossible to get rid of. If somebody wanted to pass a statute that sort of set up some body to give input, well, you know, no one's going to really object to that. So, uh, and of course, you're right. The social statistics are bad, and we should try to do something. If it were easy to fix, people would have fixed it by now. I think most of us, uh, most all Australians uh, would like to try to improve things. I, I think Warren Mundine's got the right idea. You know, we need to establish initiative, uh, get people with their own businesses. And he's done a great job with that sort of thing. And I think uh, Jacinta Price has really uh, sort of good ideas. Again, I'm not a social scientist, but most of them, I don't really think they know what they're talking about either. But uh, you know, Gary Johns has just come out with an excellent book about how we might go about solving these problems. Now, I don't purport to know much about that. I'd like the problems to be fixed. Uh, what I can say is that the, a constitutional body like the voice is not going to, in my view, do that. And the ancillary costs are going to be ginormous. Leave aside the core principled objection, which is in a Western liberal democracy, you ought not to be treating people differently based on race. And now some people at this point come in and make a, a sort of Jesuitical point where they say, well, look, uh, scientifically speaking, race doesn't make much sense. And that's true. 
You know, it's if you look at genetic diversity amongst chimpanzees, there's way more genetic diversity than there is amongst humans. Humans really don't have very much genetic diversity. You know, go from uh, Inuit in Canada to whatever group. There's very little genetic diversity. And so in a scientific sense, if someone says, well, you can't really cash out the idea of race, that's correct. I, I, I agree with that. But most people don't use the word race in a scientific sense, in a rough and ready sense. A loose sense, you know, as in there are characteristics you're born with that might relate to skin pigmentation or some other. In the loose sense of being born with characteristics you can't do anything about, we ought not to be building a constitutional structure based on those characteristics which you are born with. Now, call it race, call it something else. You know, I don't care. But that's a there, there's no real examples of democracies that do well that allocate things based on characteristics you're born with, you know. So so this is the this is the first problem with this voice thing because that is exactly what it's doing. Now, I have other objections, many more objections, and some of them are possibly even stronger. But that's the first problem, and it's a big problem. And people go, oh well, you know. Uh, it's written into the Constitution, but it doesn't have the last word. But of course, you know, there's the political reality on the ground, which we are effectively voting for in this referendum. And then there's the theoretical constitutional position that our elected legislatures will, will theoretically have the last word. And if they want to, they can tell the voice to go jump in the lake. Well, we all know that won't happen. The Labour Party will never stand up to the voice because they're going to agree with them. You know, there's the people who are likely to end up in this voice body are going to be Aboriginal activists, a few rural Aboriginals. The, the Labour Party never going to agree, disagree with them very often. And we know that the right of centre political parties in this country have the backbones of, you know, invertebrates. And so I'll give you an example from my native Canada. They changed the Constitution in 1982 to give judges a, a, a potent entrenched constitutional bill of rights, and they couldn't get it through. And so what the proponents did was they said, well, put in this provision, section 33, and that provision says that the elected parliament can override the judges. You know, the judges strike down some statute they, they don't like. They say it's rights infringing. The, the parliamentarians can override the judges for five years anytime they want for most of the rights. And so you don't need to worry. Parliament will, in legal theory, remain, you know, supreme. And you know the same people who pushed that, the minute it got enacted, entrenched, they started saying, well, you can't use it. You know, you can't use it. You can't override it. It would be illegitimate. You know how many times? It's now 40 years since we've had the you know, updated Canadian Constitution with the Section 33. At the national level in Canada, Section 33 has never been used, not once, never. My prediction is if the voice comes in, you know, this... Prime Minister Albanese has already said it would be a brave parliament that ever sort of second guessed the voice. It'll never happen. And look at look at the Liberal Party in this country. Are you telling me they're going to stand up to anyone? They can't even stand up to their own sort of Matt Keynes of the world. So uh, in theory, there'll be this sort of argument that in you know, constitutional theory, parliament has the last word. But in practice, on the ground, in terms of what really matters to us, it will not. Now you can say, well, that's not, you know, that's the fault of the parliamentarians, but we're not parliamentarians, we're voters, and we can see the future, and we can see what's going to happen. And so it's all very well and good to say there's this theoretical possibility that one day the Liberal Party will grow a backbone by some miraculous sort of Damascene conversion, and, uh, you know, they'll stand up. But in practice, it's very unlikely. So why would you vote for it? This body is going to have a lot of say. As it's worded right now, they will have a say on every single law that's passed. And the judges will, it, it will be justiciable. And the judges will have the power to, you know, be, once it's in the Constitution, the judges can say, because of this provision, Parliament has to do the following things. You know, it says may make representations, but the judges could easily turn that into a constitutional right to be consulted. And the body could slow things down and they could become rent seeking on some issues. And they could, you know, ask for money or they could drag it out so long that, you know, the parliament has to give them stuff. It'd be, can you imagine that parliament decides this is so important, we're not even going to bother to consult with the voice. I can't see that ever happening. So, I, I mean, I've only touched on the problems, 
I don't think the expert constitutional group is right in most of the things it's saying. I don't care. There's not a single skeptic on the body. You appoint this body, you know, it's like two football teams and everybody you appoint to the supposedly neutral body favors one team. Is there a conservative even on the expert constitution? There's one, maybe, if you consider Greg Craven these days a conservative, maybe. But, you know, he's one of the early architects of this. So you've got, um, you know, you've got the... Uh, the bias, the kind of built into your brain bias that this is your baby. And it's really hard. It's hard for any human being to, um, to pull away from that. So we got problems all over the board. I actually think that this is going to lose this referendum, but it would certainly help if Peter Dutton came out against it sometime, uh, you know, this century. I don't know what he's doing. Okay. So do you think that the uh, proponents of the voice are wanting to capitalize on a residue of guilt amongst the Australian community? Again, you know, you can't just take a multitude of people and give them one set of motivating views. I think certainly that's true of some people. I mean, there's people of goodwill who think, you know, well, we might as well give this a try, but then I don't know that all of them, some do, but I don't know that all of them realize the knock on bad consequences. I mean, we're all in the game of cost benefit analysis, right? I mean, I was a big I was a big critic of lockdowns because what happened was they did benefit analysis. They didn't do cost benefit analysis. And there's a lot of costs. And I, you know, right now today, as I speak, Australians excess deaths are running at what, 15, 17%? Way more people are dying now because of the decisions we made. Because people said, oh, well, you know, we don't, we have to, we have to look, we have to, focus all of our intention on this small group of people over 85 who might die. What they didn't say is, but you know, the cost to the young, to the poor, uh, to people who are missing cancer checks are going to be enormous. So I'm in the game of cost benefit analysis. I think people who just, who just do benefit analysis are really doing us all a disservice. And in cost benefit terms, the costs of this voice body are enormous. Now, are there potential benefits on the horizon that, you know, you can hold your hands and Peter can pull out the guitar and play Kumbaya and it's possible there'll be a benefit or two? Yes. You know, that's, but that, you know, that doesn't take away from the fact that there are a lot of costs. So, uh, you know, I'm not in the game of attributing one monolithic set of motives to people on the other side. I think there's it's like anything. There's people of goodwill. There's smart people on the other side. There's people who don't know anything. You know, it's a it's a broad church, same as the no camp. Um, I'm happy to you know debate anybody on the other side because I don't think their arguments stand up to it. But I I don't like getting into the game of saying you know you're you're a bad person because you disagree with me. Sure. That is what, by the way, Prime Minister Albanese is doing ever so subtly, and almost every member of the advisory group, these people who are, you know, they're, they're subtly suggesting that you haven't got a heart if you're not for this, you know, you're a bad person, or you're not very smart, you don't know anything, again, uh, almost certainly false. So across this spectrum of motivations on the other side, I just don't think their arguments are as strong as the no camp arguments. Could, could the voice then, Jim, be a, a kind of Trojan horse that, lead, that leads to so much more than most of us considered or even wanted? Well, I mean, if you look at the statement from the heart, it's a three-pronged thing. And now, you know, we're, only, we're not voting on the other three, but certainly putting something into the written constitution opens up the door to judicial activism. Now, Greg Craven used to be one of the biggest opponents of judicial activism. When I first got here in 2005, he had these great arguments about the high court, you know, making things up. I think he was right. He seems to have decided that there won't be any judicial activism based on this. I don't know why, because um, this is technical, but for the lawyers listening, this provision is going to get its own chapter in the constitution. It's not just going to be changing the words of one of the sections. Hang on a sec little copy of the Australian Constitution. They're not just going to be changing one, the wording of one section, and they're not going to be changing one of the heads of powers. They're going to give this its own chapter in the Constitution. Why does that matter? Well, it's a bit technical, but in terms of the adventurism of the courts in this country, two of the big areas where I think they've just, over the last hundred years, gone and made stuff up. One is the separation of powers. You know, when you come from Canada, Canadian educated or Britain or New Zealand, the whole separation of powers jurisprudence just looks bizarre. And that flows from the different chapters in the Constitution. 
So it's quite plausible that the judges will say, oh, look, they gave the voice its own chapter in the Constitution. It must mean that they want it to be a very powerful body, blah, blah, blah. The second problem is also loosely based on this idea of separate chapters is the implied freedom of political communication, right? So to give your readers a very quick, sorry, listeners, watchers, a very quick overview, um, there have been two constitutional referenda in this country to try to bring in a Bill of Rights. They both lost. The second one, 1988, lost in every state, even lost in Victoria. And if you can't win a, a referendum, even in Victoria, there's a problem. And they didn't even win the, the uh, Republic there. But four years later, and it was a very basic proposal, freedom of speech, you know, freedom of religion. And of course, the problem with the Bill of Rights is it makes the judges more powerful. And so four years later, in 1992, the judges just made up, in my view, they say they discovered it in the entrails of the Constitution. You know, it had been lying there unseen for 90 years, and all of a sudden it was discovered, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think they just made it up. Uh, I've written about that at length, but anyway, I won't bore your listeners. But um, they discovered this implied freedom that uh, limited what Parliament could do. And again, it's loosely based on Section, uh, you know, the the uh, directly elected provision related to the Senate, and it's loosely, loosely based on the structure of the Constitution. Again, the way it's structured. So a separate chapter for this voice body is is like. Um, you know, laying out candy in front of the unelected judges and saying, here you go, you know, eat this candy and start making up new things. Now, I, I don't want to overstate it because, you know, the, the adventurism, the judicial usurpation of the job of the legislature, it doesn't happen right away. You know, New Zealand brought in a statutory bill of rights and, you know, that was in 1990. It was only last year that the New Zealand top courts discovered that, you know, there was a right for 16 year olds to vote. It's one of the worst reason cases ever, right? So it takes a while, but the judges just get into the game of being sort of hero judges. You know, they're going to deign to tell us from on high, all of us mere voters, uh, all sorts of things about what is rights respecting and what isn't rights respecting and what's allowable and what's not. They already in Australia do proportionality analysis. So I don't, have any confidence that we can constrain the judges once we already it's difficult to do if you go back to 2020 in the love decision based on nothing in the constitution zero the high court four to three and of those four three were appointed by the coalition government in the last nine years that shows you how bad they are at appointing top judges but they decided in love that um even non-citizens who claim to be aboriginals could not be deported if they pass some amorphous <clears throat> tests about actually being aboriginal. So assume they meet the aboriginal test. You can't deport them. They're not citizens. They're criminals. This is outrageous. It was an outrageous decision. And there is no <clears throat> textual warrant in the Constitution for that decision. And there's no way to point to any intended law, you know, any lawmaker who intended that result. They just, in my view, made it up. And they made it up talking about things like otherness and spiritual connections to the land. It's like you'd wandered out of the High Court of Australia and into some university seminar by a French deconstructionist professor. You know, Professor Foucault is now talking and they absorb this. And, you know, this was outrageous. And this is without the voice. So anyone who tells you that there won't be, these things won't be justiciable, doesn't know what they're talking about. And anyone who says, well, the judges will be constrained well, I'm betting against it. Again, it won't happen in the first couple of years. It'll happen. And so there's this isn't one of my biggest worries about the voice being entrenched in the Constitution in its own chapter is the raw likelihood of, you know, activists usurping the role of parliament judges. Uh, so again, if it were just a statute to set up some body where you pick Aboriginals to comment on Aboriginal matters, we've had those bodies. You know, it didn't work out very well, but I'm happy to try them again. I don't care. Don't put it in the Constitution. It's a really bad idea. Do you think that the voice could actually lead to the Aborigines in our country getting a, a, greater, a greater leverage of a political power than the rest of the Australian community? Yeah, again, the problem is when you just lump everyone together and call them Aborigines, a lot of Aboriginal people are against the voice. Jacinta Price, Warren Mundine, loads of them. And it's not clear who will get this leverage. I think there will be leverage for the body we call the voice. 
but you can't treat Aboriginal views as some sort of monolithic body who agree on everything. It's like treating all women, you know, as if they're all left-wing activist university people. The only women who are left-wing activist people are left-wing activist academics and universities, right? And so, you know, the body won't represent all Aboriginal views because you know, they're not all monolithic. We're all different. And you cannot deem to know what a person's views are just by looking at their skin pigmentation or the kind of, you know, chromosomal background they have. So I think this body will have a lot of say on the body politic. But I'm not prepared to equate the voice with some sort of Rousseau like, you know, general will of the Aboriginal community. That's just garbage. Yes. You know, so yes, it will have a lot of say, but it won't won't be the say of all Aboriginals, and some will be quite opposed to it, and some won't. It'll be my guess, and I don't know, but my guess is over time it'll be taken over by the activist class. You know, there's a great quote by um John O'Sullivan, who wrote the biography on Thatcher, um, Reagan, and uh, Pope John Paul, Paul II, I, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, the book, and he was also, uh, so he was Thatcher's speechwriter. He wrote that book. He set up National Review in the U.S. He was hired by Conrad Black to set up the first conservative, really conservative newspaper in Canada, the National Post. It's it's lapsed since he left, but he's the best connected uh, conservative living, I think, in the Anglosphere. And he has a law you can look it up on uh, on uh, Google. But John O'Sullivan's law is that any organization that is not overtly right of center conservative will over time become left wing. And that law, as far as I can tell, it's not a real scientific law. It's a claim about the way the world is right now amongst humans. It's correct. You know, right now we're watching the Liberal Party move left, you know, because it's if not prepared to be overtly right. So any, and so that's what's going to happen to this voice body. Even if the initial intake of uh, people who get chosen, we don't, and we, we're, not, we're not told how they're going to get chosen because Mr. Albanese has given us no details. You know, we've got a couple of sentence proposal you're supposed to vote on and you have no idea. He just says, we'll leave it to Parliament. Well, Remember, the parliament that's going to be making the calls if this gets approved is a parliament dominated by labor in the lower house. They can do whatever they want. And in the upper house, labor in the greens and one left wing independent out of the ACT. Those are the people who'll be designing this. Now, nobody I know of sensibly votes for a blank check. You know, if they say, well, we, I can't tell you any of the details. Can't say anything, but uh, I'm prepared to offer you a new job, but I can't answer any questions till after you've signed up for, you know, forever. You sign up forever, and then, you know, we'll hash out the details. You know, it's, it's laughable, right? But the problem is for Albanese is if he gives details, people are going to vote against it. So he can't give any details, in my view. And he, so he's playing it uh, in, in a sort of, well, you know, if you've got, if you're a well-intentioned person with a sort of sort of sly uh hint towards you know you if you don't agree with me you're a racist but if you're a well-intentioned person you can just trust us to sort this out after the fact well no who who looks around the democratic world right now and says you know the one group of people i really trust is the political class you know boy you know i might not trust the journalists and i might not trust the other experts but i really i'm prepared to bank i'm prepared to bet the mortgage on the political class i don't think so Right. So you know, we also have the problem that there's really no detail. I mean, it's, it's astounding, really. So we don't know what counts as. So, so here's the here's what they're proposing. Quote, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. The Aboriginal and Torres, that's sentence one. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to Parliament. I think the judges will turn that into a, a, a constitutional right to be consulted. And the, and the executive government, so both, on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that in theory is everything, and the parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to the composition, function, powers, and procedures of this body, the voice. And so we're going to get asked, do you support an alteration to the constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? And here's what we don't know. This is just a sample. You know, we don't know who's going to count as an Aboriginal person. We don't know who's going to decide 
Who's going to have the power to authorize who counts as an Aboriginal person? We don't know what counts as a matter relating to Aboriginal peoples. In theory, every bill relates to Aboriginal people, so there's no constraint. Uh, we don't know what may means and may make representations. I think it's going to turn into a constitutional uh, uh, right to be consulted. If they, if they, if that's not what they intend, they could certainly fix up, tighten up that wording. Um, we also don't know how anyone gets to be in this so-called voice body. You know, that's we have no idea. Um, we don't know how much more difficult this body will make the task of getting laws through Parliament. Again, Australia together with the U.S. and possibly Italy, we have real bicameralism. So we have a really strong upper house. In the entire democratic world, only in the U.S., if you were running for office, would you prefer to be elected to the upper house rather than the lower house? Like everywhere else, if you're an ambitious politician, you want to be in the lower house, right? In the Westminster British system, you can't even be prime minister by convention unless you're in the lower house. Um, and so nowhere else really has the kind of strong upper house that we have, except, you know, we've copied the US, but we still have the Westminster system sitting in the background. So you'd still rather be in the lower house. But we have, we don't even have the constraints on the Senate that the Americans have. So the Americans have a sensible voting system for the Senate. You have first past the post to choose your members of the House, and you have first past the post in the upper up, for the Senate. So what that means is there's only two parties, the in party and the out party, the winners, the losers. So let's say I'm voting in Wyoming for the Senate and something that the, you know, one of the parties, party X has done in the Senate, I don't like. I can punish them by voting for party Y in Wyoming, even though the main senators who did it were from Delaware and Arkansas. But in Australia, we have a, we have a proportional voting system for the Senate, single transferable vote. And that means you get the same number of senators, same as the US in each state. But it also means that you get some independent senators. And they often decide whether a bill gets through or not. Now, if I'm voting in Queensland and basically a bill was put through by you know, some independent senator from Tasmania who got in because she's got an extended family, because it doesn't take that many votes to win in, in, to get a Senate spot in Tasmania. I think your vote in Tasmania is worth, what, 15 times what it is in New South Wales? You just look at the relative population. Um, well, there's nothing I can do in Queensland to punish those senators. Again, in the U.S. with their voting system, you have the two teams. And if you don't like what one team's doing, you vote for the other team. But here, if you don't like what, uh, you know, the senator from the ACT is doing, who's an independent, or you don't like what the senator from some independent senator from, there's nothing you can do. And again, I think structurally, the way an upper house works is these independent senators are always more willing to vote for more spending and bigger government and you know more intrusive government. And if you get elected the way Abbott did in 2030 and try to rein in the size of government, none of the independents will vote. What's in it for them? You know, how does that help them to get reelected? These, you know, nobody's ever heard of them. They don't gain, they, they'd much rather be able to dole out moolah. So that's a structural problem. And so it's already hard to get laws through in Australia. And now you're going to add another layer. Again, we already have more difficulty getting laws through in Australia than you do in Canada. In each Canadian province, there's no, there's no bicameralism at the pro provincial level anywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's like Queensland. I quite like that Queensland doesn't have an upper house. Um, now, I guess if you get to things being as disastrous, you asked about education. Now, forget Aboriginal education. The education system in Australia for everyone is appalling. I think I just read we ranked 29th out of the 31 rich countries in the world. New South Wales, this is according to Mark Latham, the second one, but I suspect he's right. New South Wales has the fallest fast, uh, sorry, the fastest falling educational standards in the world. This is the rich state of New South Wales under a supposedly conservative parate. We know he's not, and he's been awful and woeful. But, um, you know, we have educational problems across the board. Now, is it worse for average? Probably, yes. But come on. I mean, our national curriculum is woeful. And again, this is another thing that Australians don't share with Canadians and Americans. When I'm in Canada and the U.S., people just get federalism. They get the idea that, you know, different levels should be making different decisions. And when I got here, it wasn't too long after that, that it was, a, you know, of course, a conservative government said, oh, we're going to have a national curriculum. Now, 
if you cash out that argument, what is good about a national curriculum? One size fits all for the entire country. Well, it's good if you assume that government generally gets things right, you know? And so whatever body they set up to set out the national, it's gonna make a really good national curriculum. Well, I don't have that assumption. I think government normally screws things up. And the advantage of a federal system where in Canada, you have, you know, each province has its own educational system, or sorry, its own curriculum. Alberta has a pretty good curriculum. It scores pretty highly. Ontario and Quebec, no. And there's pressure on the bad provinces to copy the good province. And there's competition. That's federalism. You know, we talk about cooperative federalism. That's just stupid. That just, you lose all the benefits of federalism and everyone does the same thing. And I know that Australians have it baked into them that you should have the same curriculum everywhere and the same standards everywhere. That's the French one size fits all centralized model. I don't think it, it doesn't, you know, the, the wealthiest democratic countries in the world are all federalist. They have real federalism. They have competition. So, you know, a national curriculum was never a good idea in my view, unless you, you know, if you have any skepticism about how well one level of government will do, you're, you want, you know, we want six different school curriculum. In the U.S., often the school curriculum gets put down to the level of the county. So they have hundreds of school curricula. In Switzerland, the parents in the region pick the curriculum. And Switzerland has great school curricula. So, you know, the, we have so many problems with education. I don't think we can go and just sort of focus on the problem with educating Aboriginal people. Let's focus on the problem with educating the smartest, wealthiest people in the country because they're not getting a good education. You know, they're, what did I read? Uh, school leavers' ability in math and sciences today is a year and a half below what it was 20 years ago. So, I mean, this is really catastrophically bad. Now, does anyone bring it up? No. Is anyone prepared to take on the uh, school bureaucracies? You know, in the in the administ you know in the bureaucracies no so i mean i i think we got i mean i'm 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 off topic here but if you think education is in a solid state you know gonski saved everything he made it worse you know, they're throwing money at uh, things that don't fix there's no correlation in the rich world between the size of the class and educational outcomes once you you know get below a certain number korea south korea has people, classrooms in the 30s and they do better on every front and this this jargon about having eight people in the classroom, you know, and we've got all sorts of problems. So, so I I don't know about that either. Well, thank you, thank you for that that um, portion of, of your talk about the education of Australia, which I'm actually quite interested in because I'm a teacher. But um, but Peter has some more questions for you from our from our viewers. So I'll hand over to Peter to add some questions to you, Jim. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor. And the first question I've got here is, uh, why is nobody talking about how much this will cost? I said, it wouldn't surprise me that within a decade, it will be a financial headache, like many other government run things. You've got a comment on that, uh, Professor? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, traditionally right of centre uh, coalition governments sold themselves as, you know, careful, uh, careful guardians of the budget, but, you know, they, they can't do that anymore. Again, one of the sad and sorry side effects of uh, the Morrison government during the, co during the COVID was they ran the highest spending, biggest taxing government since the Second World War. So how do you stand up and say labor is a bigger spending government? You can't, not with a straight face. And then they go, oh, it's all because of COVID. Again, the country in the world right now with the lowest excess deaths cumulatively throughout the whole pandemic is Sweden. Sweden copied a hundred years worth of data, which said, focus your attention on the vulnerable, don't lock down, don't destroy the small business economy, blah, blah. They did everything the playbook said. Every other country in the world virtually, except for you know, some jurisdictions like Florida and South Dakota, they just panicked. And I don't know, you know, you can't say it's signed. What data changed in six weeks, you know, between November 2019 and the end of February 20? What data changed? Well, we watched the communist Chinese weld people in their home. And we watched, you know, some highly selective videos coming out of Italy. And that was it. And so there's no new data. It's not scientific. The, the guy Tegnell, the chief epidemiologist from Sweden, a left of center government, he should get a Nobel Prize from it. Every call he made, except for moving uh, old people out of the hospital, putting them into old age care. And everyone made that mistake. It was a stupid mistake, but he admitted it within the first month. 
bad mistake. Um, every call he made was right. And they are right now, you know, again, their data is great, which is why the press, which was shocking during the pandemic, shocking. Uh, you know, they just became a sort of arm of the fear porn sort of establishment. I don't know what they were doing, you know, daily. But anyway, my point here is having spent like drunken sailors, which you sort of had to if you're going to close someone's business. And we massively overpaid, even on JobKeeper. We 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 spent more per capita than the Kiwis. We we massively overspent. So how are you going to start nitpicking about a body on the voice that's going to, it is going to be expensive, but in the context of blowing, what, what are we, what's our deficit now? 40% of GDP? I mean, we've got a massive deficit and there's no one talking about it. And so this in a way just becomes a little sort of uh, peripheral addition to an already totally out of control budget. Um, and so, you know, the reason no one's talking about it is because in big picture terms, having spent like you were completely out of control. And, you know, I'm still mad about that because the answer to, well, we had to spend if we're closing all the businesses down was, well, you should have never been in the game of closing businesses down and, and you know, having mandates and stuff. You should have basically done what uh, uh, Tanders at Tegno, Anders Tegno did in Sweden, which is to follow the data, to do what 100 years worth of data, including the Spanish flu of 1918, said to do and not panic. And, you know, I don't agree that in the face of uncertainty, you immediately move to the far end of the sort of precautionary principle and go completely crazy. There's no data that supports that as sensible. I understand that once you scare people witless and they think they're going to die, you know, there's studies in Britain where people thought if I caught COVID, I had a 30% chance of dying. Again, if you're under 30, you had a thousand times less chance of dying than someone over 85. And it's roughly about the same chance of dying of the flu. Young people were never at any serious risk. Now, you used to be able to go at the early days onto the Oxford University website, type in your age, your health, you know, your basic characteristics. My kids did that. They had a one in one had a one in 280,000 chance of dying, and one had a like a one in 200,000 chance of dying. Now, that's less than the chance of getting hit by lightning. And we were making crazy decisions. People don't get risk. I mean, I did a math degree and I'm sitting here thinking, what are you people doing? And I don't blame people. I blame the press. But at any rate, it all feeds back into why nobody cares about the cost of this. Well, because there's no plausible scenario where we're going to get our budget back under control in the next 20 years. You know, we no one talks about running a surplus anymore. Not that anyone ever managed to do it since uh, Costello. You know, the golden days when I got here in 2005, Australia had zero government debt, right? John Howard had no debt. We can quibble about whether he should have had more tax cuts and less spending. But in terms of the overall picture, you know, Australia was an outlier. Our debt was our, our national government debt, not the state's. And now we're, you know, we're our, our trajectory of debt is one of the worst going. Sure, we're below, our debt to GDP is below lots of other countries, but that's because it's only been, you know, 18 years since we had no debt, whereas other countries always had that. We're on a terrible trajectory. And so I, I don't think trying to oppose the voice based on its cost is, has any traction at all, you know, because uh, nobody's prepared to take those, you know, the, the coalition isn't prepared to take any a sort of fiscal husbandry to any elections at all right now because you know they spent worse than labor. I hate to say that, but it's true. They spent worse than labor. No, thank, thank you, Professor. I've got another question here. Uh, don't we already have an Indigenous Aboriginal voice to Parliament in the person of the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs herself, an Indigenous person, and Assistant Minister in the Senate? Um, and uh, as you mentioned, about another 11 people. You got a comment on that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's semantics. They, the people on the other side would say, well, you know, we want more input. We want a wider selection of uh, voices on the Aboriginal side. And just having someone who's in the governing party appointed minister is not enough. You know, again, people can have different points of view on that. And again, I don't really care if we have this body, as long as it's not entrenched into the constitution, if it's a statutory body, who cares? If it turns out to be the disaster, I think it will be, you can get rid of it. If you vote for something in the Constitution, it's going to be there forever. Now, it's true that you could another government could uh, signal that they want to have a new referendum, constitutional referendum, to get the voice out. 
but we can't trigger that as citizens. In Switzerland, we could trigger it. The only people who can trigger a referendum, a constitutional referendum, are the government in Canberra. Not even the states can trigger one. That's another bad mistake with our constitution. You know, the states have no ability to trigger a referendum to change the constitution. And my honest view is that no party will do that. No, you know, the labor will never do it because they don't want to. And the libs will never have the courage to do it. If the voice body turns out to be bad, they will never have the gumption to trigger a constitutional referendum to get it out. So you're, you're, you know, you're basically being asked to sign a blank check forever. Now, you know, doesn't seem like a great bargain to me, but, you know, I'm pretty minority amongst the university academic class. You know, thank you, Professor. Um, I've got another question here. Uh, Professor Mark Curray once wrote, the real reason for failure of referenda is that people's disinclination to confer power on the Commonwealth Parliament and government. Do you think that remains the truth? Well, it's partly right. You get a lot of current constitutional uh, academics in Australia say, oh, it's so hard to change the Australian... It's so... It's just not... In, in procedural terms, to change our constitution, you have a referenda and you need to pass two steps. The first step is you have a referenda where everyone in the country under compulsory voting votes, yes or no. And you need 50% plus one. That is not a high procedural test. If you belong to a tennis club and they say, we're, you know, we're going to change things up here, but we want to we want to first get a vote of everyone and you need 50% plus one. That's not a hard test procedurally. The second leg is a nod to federalism where you need 50% plus one of the voters in over half the states. <clears throat> right. There have been 44 constitutional referenda in this country. 36 have failed. So eight succeeded, 36 failed. Of the 36 failures, 31 failed. So all but five failed on the first step. You couldn't get half of Australians to agree. Now, that is not a hard procedural test. I, I would put it this way. Most left-wing university academics who teach constitutional law would have liked a lot of those referenda to succeed and they didn't. So they moan about how hard it is to get it through. If you wanna know, I mean, I, I looked at the 44 and I would have agreed with the outcome in all but two. I think, you know, I mean, you, and it's true that as uh, Professor Curry or Dr. Curry says, a lot of the referenda were related to giving more powers to the center. And, you know, voters said no. And then, of course, what happened is the High Court of Australia gave it to the center anyway through their approach to interpreting federalism disputes. We have the most pro-center outcomes in federalism in the entire federalist world. And it's not because the voters wanted that. And it's not because the original design of our constitution dictated that. It's because every time a a case between the states and the high, and the center, the Commonwealth got to the High Court, and I exaggerate slightly, but almost every time the High Court sides with the center. They have adopted an approach to interpreting federalism matters, which makes it almost impossible for the states to win. You know, uh, the Tasmanian Dam case. They read all of the Section Fifty One heads power. They read them in a sort of literal, expansive way, and if there's any way to fit the law into any of those, the center wins. And it's a ridiculous approach. It, it ignores the intended meaning of the lawmakers at the start. And what they did in Tasmania, they, they looked at the external affairs power. The center had signed some treaty related to environmental matters. And so, hey, they win. You know, on that basis, the center wins every time. Or work choices. One of the great flaws in uh, John Howard. I like John Howard, but, you know, he's not a federalist. And he decided to try to change the labor relations regime in this country. Now, I don't like the labor relations regime. I think, you know, Australia is one of the only, we're the only country in the world that operates this early 1900s sort of approach to labor relations where civil servant type, judge type people decide, you know, what people are going to get paid. They don't even do that in France. New Zealand was the second last country to have it. They got rid of it in the 80s. You know, this is, for a Canadian, this is just a crazy way to structure labor relations where you have these awards that are 18,000 pages long and even the ABC doesn't comply with them because nobody knows what they say. Right. And so, um, you know, they tried, Howard tried to change that and I'm in favor of changing it, but he tried to shove it through under the corporation's power. 
Now, nobody can honestly think that, you know, it's clear from our constitution that labor relations went to the states and we had six different labor relations structures. And it was, you know, we were better off before Howard meddled than we are today, because of course, once you centralize it in the work choices cases, it was a five to two decision where Callanan and Kirby, when they never agree in dissent, they both said, this is crazy, but we would have been better off if the high court had struck it down as they should have. Because as soon as labor came in, now that it's a central power, they took us way back. We're way worse off now than we were. If you're a sort of small government, uh, you know, let people make their own calls type of person, we're way worse off now in labor relations than we were before Howard tried to, you know, shove through something that really the Constitution had allocated to the states. And so labor relations are a problem. But but what I was going to say about constitutions, again, think of how we change the constitution. We have a vote of every citizen. And, you know, there's this ancillary federalism leg where you have to win in over half the states. Compare that to the U.S. If you want to change the constitution in the U.S., you need both houses of Congress and three quarters, three quarters of the state legislature. And nobody asks the voters. That's a really hard procedure. Canada's is even harder in some ways. So since 1982 in Canada, if you want to change the Canadian constitution, you need both houses of parliament, and then you need two thirds of the state of the provincial legislatures. There's 10 of them, so you need seven. And they have to, and, the, and that has to represent over half the Canadian population because Ontario and Quebec right now represent most of the Canadian population, I don't know. So Ontario and Quebec together have a veto. Now. That sounds hard, but there's some reserved matters in the Canadian Constitution. They're separately set aside. And to change those, you need every single province, their legislator, to say yes. You know what one of those reserved matters is? It's the constitutional monarchy. I get people asking me, how come they don't talk about the monarchy? You know, there's no Republican movement in Canada. Is that because, you know, everyone's a constitutional monarchist? No, it's because the way to change the Canadian Constitution makes it impossible. You need every single, so if you try to change the constitutional monarchy to a Republican candidate, you need both houses of parliament and all 10 provinces. Now, Prince Edward Island is the smallest province in Canada. Canada has about 35 million people. Prince Edward Island has about 130,000. Makes Tasmania look like a big pocket. They have a veto. You know, if you haven't been to Prince Edward Island, it's a beautiful place, small, it's an island. It's uh, got some golf courses, they grow potatoes. And one of their sideline sort of main industries is tourism. Loads of Japanese go to uh, Prince Edward Island every year because Anne of Green Gables, great book by Lucy Maud Montgomery, is set in Prince Edward Island and it's on the Japanese school curriculum. And so you get loads of Japanese coming to Prince Edward Island to see where Anne of Green Gables would have lived had she been real, but she wasn't. Now, I, I'm making fun of this, but 130,000 people have a veto. So everyone knows in Canada, you will never be able to get rid of the monarchy. So there's no Republican movement, because why would you bother? Now, that's a hard constitution to change. When people say it's hard to change the constitution in Australia, I don't want to be rude here, but they're full of crap. You know, The procedure is easy. It's as democratic as you can get. What they don't like is they don't like the views of their fellow citizens who keep voting no. And they keep voting no often on matters that try to give more power to the center. But again, you know, why bother? The uh, the high court will give it to them eventually anyway. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think that we have a very good system for changing the constitution. Um, and as I said, I think on 42 out of the 44 matters, I would have agreed with the voters. You, know, you don't expect that. You don't expect to agree on everything. But I think we have a very good way of changing the Constitution. What we, unfortunately, what we're not able to do because the, the um, founders of our Constitution never crossed their mind, but we should have a power for the states to trigger referenda. And we don't have that because, you know, in 1900, the view was that, uh, you know, the Senate would be a, a house for the states. That's what it was designed to be. And then, you know, strong party government came in after that. And so now, you know, you don't see yourself as a senator for Queensland, you see yourself as a Labour senator. And there's no way you'd stand up against your own party, the Labour will throw you out of the party to begin with. It's the only Labour party in the world, where if you cross the floor on any vote, you're out. You know, Jeremy Corbyn crossed the floor about 150 times, and then he became the leader. Uh, and so, you know, we have unbelievable party discipline in the Labour party in this country. So nobody sees themselves these days as a senator for fill in the state. 
they see themselves as a, an, a member of parliament for your party. So I guess that's my long-winded answer. I would say that we have an easy procedural system for changing our constitution, one of the easiest going, but sensibly Australians think they have a good constitution, which they do. And they are very reticent to change that constitution. Well, that's sensible. So that's my answer. Okay, th thank you, Professor. I've got another question. Uh, Mark Ray also comments, the Chief Justice has justified in the Marbo case, the process of judicial review making by reference to the need to provide judgments which are humane, practical and just, and in accordance with fundamental and community values. Can this be ameliorated? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm as big a critic of judicial adventurism in this country as anyone. We're, we're not as badly off as Canada or Israel or the US or Britain. All of those places have judges that are in the last 30 years more inclined to gainsay and second guess the elected legislature. Um, I guess you could say about Mabo that strictly speaking, it's a common law decision. It's not a constitutional decision. And had the parliament wanted to, it could have just enacted a law and said, no, we're overriding the decision. You know, to some extent, they, they played around with native title. And again, one of the problems, I mean, I'm a small government, free market guy. Uh, I think one of the problems with native title is it doesn't give individual ownership. And it's very difficult to create a modern successful economy where you don't individually own stuff so you own it with a group so you know if you believe in incentive and you believe that uh you know to some extent we all want a safety net reward should follow hard work and ability and merit and that sort of thing well how does that work with group title i mean you know it doesn't work is the answer and so that's a that's a big problem now no will anyone take that on and say look we need to get rid of this idea of group title, native title, we need to give it to people individually. And, you know, sure, there's a risk that because they own it individually, they'll sell it. But that's, you know, that's what people do when they own things themselves. So uh, I just think there are loads of problems. Um, I don't really see any governments enacting too much legislation to um, undercut the sort of whole native title regime, but they could. So it's not a, strictly speaking, you know, the problem with a constitutional decision is the judges purport to link it into the written constitution and the written constitution sits above parliament and parliament can't do anything about it. If you decide a case as a judge and it's a common law decision, common law just means judge made law. Well, the statutes of parliament sit above this, the common law. And so if you don't like a common law decision, you know, New Zealand decided that they didn't like the whole entire tort law regime where, you know, that dealt with accidents and compensating people who get hurt in accidents. And they just enacted a no fault system, you know, so you took out all of, you don't sue in New Zealand. If you get hurt in an accident, there's a chart, right? And, you know, when you start thinking about it, that New Zealand decision makes a fair bit of sense. It, you know, uh, an accident regime to deal with people who get hurt because of negligence or carelessness, if you look at Canada which, or Australia or the US, you know, something like 65 cents on the dollar does not go to the victim. It goes to the lawyers who run the system. It goes to the insurance companies. It goes to the judges. You know, I, I think that university bureaucracies are about the most inefficient in the world. But even a university bureaucracy is more efficient than channeling money to victims in uh, the current uh, sort of uh, regime we have for compensating victims. So, you know, the tort law regime, most of the money doesn't end up in the pocket of the victim. Now, it's also provides, it's supposed to provide something of a deterrence. You know, you don't want to lose money, but everyone has insurance. You know, when you read tort law articles, everyone just pretends that there's no insurance. And so because you're always worried about being negligent, you'll drive with both hands at 10 and 2 o'clock, never taking your eyes off the thing, but everyone's got insurance, right? And as soon as you have insurance, you know, you, you don't drive like that. And so the whole, and, and so the, the point here is that in New Zealand, and it was a contestable call, they just decided we don't like the state of the judge made law, the common law when it comes to, you know, the tort law related to negligence and carelessness. And so they just swept it away with the statute. Now you might be in favor of that, you might not, 
But the hierarchy is clear. Parliament beats the common law. The trouble is that Constitution, the written Constitution, sits above Parliament. And if the judges can get their hands on the Constitution, then their decisions then trump Parliament. That's the problem. You do not change the written Constitution lightly, especially in today's world where when you glance around the common law democratic world, <clears throat> judicial activism is increasing and has increased everywhere. That's just a fact. You can go read Rand Herschel, left of center guy. He has books on, you know, they call it juristocracy, critarchy with a K. Depends if you like Latin or Greek. Um, but you know, we have problems on this front. And so again, we should be very hesitant to screw around with our written constitution. Thank you, Professor. I'll hand it back over to Andrew now. I did have a couple more questions, but we'll have to leave it there. Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Peter. So thank you, thank you, Jim, for your informed and interesting comments on The Voice today. Thanks also to our viewers today for participating. We look forward to voting in The Voice uh, Bill and the referendum later in the year. God bless you all. Thank you very much for having me, gentlemen, and uh, thanks for everyone who uh, decided that they wanted to spend an hour. Uh, again, sounds like my mum, so thank you very much. That's great. Appreciate it.